All right. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I imagine a number of people will still be shuffling in. Um, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sohil Sood. I direct some of the global health education efforts at UCSF. Um, and today, I know at minimum, we've got three audiences here with us. Uh, we have our pediatric global health uh, pathway residents uh, from UCSF and our adolescent medicine fellows in the adolescent medicine division at UCSF um, and folks I imagine from the International Association from Adolescent Health joining us, um, in addition to members from the public at large too. But as part of UCSF's Global Child Health Lecture Series, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Jason Nagata to uh, speak to us about global adolescent health. Dr. Nagata is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Adolescent Medicine and Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine at UCSF, an affiliate faculty of the Institute for Global Health Sciences as well. He is co-founder and co-chair of the International Association for Adolescent Health Young Professionals Network. Um, and he'll, he's you know, done work around the world, particularly in Kenya, and um, we're uh, delighted to, to welcome him to the talk. So thank you, Jason. I'll uh, turn it over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Sol. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to give this talk, um, both for the UCSF trainees who are interested in global health and also for uh, members of the International Association for Adolescent Health. So welcome, everyone. And while this talk is uh, mainly about global adolescent health. Uh, I also have a secondary sort of objective to talk about um, career development and some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, so as an overview of today's talk, uh, I'm gonna talk about three sort of didactic sections. Um, the first is the World Health Organization's research priorities for adolescent health in low and middle income countries. Um, second is some research that I've done on food insecurity in Kenya. Um, and last, I'm going to be talking about the International Association for Adolescent Health, which has recently formed a Young Professionals Network. Um, and so for each of these three sort of cases, I'm going to start with a didactic presentation as though I were like presenting this at a conference or a formal talk. Um, but then I also wanted to provide you with a little bit of behind the scenes action um, afterwards. Um, so kind of to talk about the lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, and uh, you know, sort of showing that you know, everything doesn't always go as planned, but um, this is sort of how we learn in global health. And so, um, you know, it's just as much about the career development aspects as it is about the actual content. Um, so to get started, uh, the main portion of this talk is on research priorities for global adolescent health. Um, and so it's just a background for those of you who aren't as familiar with adolescent health um, adolescence actually has a number of different definitions. The formal World Health Organization definition is um, 10 to 19, so that's the current official definition of adolescence. Um, but as you can see, there are varying terms for their varying um, uh, ages that are around adolescence. So there's um, you know, youth and young adulthood, which is maybe on the older side, and some people argue can go up to 30. Um, whereas, you know, adolescence in the official definition is 10 to 19. Some have argued, like in this Lancet article um, by Susan Sawyer, that really adolescence and the developmental um, changes that occur during adolescence actually do extend in, at least into the early 20s, and so we should really consider all of this uh, along a spectrum. So there are 1.2 billion adolescents uh, from the WHO definition in the world, um, 10 to 19 years, and that makes up 16% of the world's population. Um, a vast majority of these live in low and middle income countries, and actually 97% uh, of deaths among young people occur in low and middle income countries. Uh, so the World Health Organization uh, you know, has put together statistics on top causes of mortality um, by for boys and for girls. And so this is just a summary of um, top causes of mortality. So the yellow is the younger adolescents, so 10 to 14 years old. Um, the blue is older adolescents, 15 to 19 years old. Um, as you can see in this group, road injury, interpersonal violence, self-harm are the leading causes in boys. Uh, and then in girls, uh, 
you know, this changes a bit to the maternal conditions and then self-harm and then road injury in the older adolescents. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is just an important context, um, especially for us in the global north who, uh, you know, uh, the sort of burden of adolescence may be a little bit different. So, I think I'm really excited actually about this talk because I think that global child health has traditionally focused on um, under five mortality. Um, and, you know, for good reason, there's a lot of death and, um, and sort of the paradigm of survive, thrive, and transform. You know, a lot of um, traditional focus has been in the first thousand days of life. Um, but I think that this is a really exciting time for adolescent health because more and more people are realizing that. Um, that actually adolescence is a very important time. Um, and, uh, and several United Nations organizations and global organizations are um, putting more emphasis on adolescent health. So the, for instance, the sustainable development goals have very specific metrics now related to adolescent health. Um, across the UN, uh, they have developed a global strategy on women's, children's, and they added the word adolescence health. Um, and there was recently a Lancet Commission specifically focused on adolescent health and well-being. Um, and finally, the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization re recently um, put out a document on the global accelerated action for the health of adolescents. So this is all very exciting, and I think that this is a growing field, um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit about my small contribution to this. Um, which was uh, a research priorities exercise for eight areas of adolescent health in low and middle income countries. Um, so this was a, a project that I did actually while I was an intern at the World Health Organization's um, adolescent health group. Um, and basically, based on those um, mortality statistics that we just went over, um, there were certain areas that uh, were identified to be really under-researched specifically in low and middle income countries. And so the WHO wanted to um, provide some guidance as to what might be top uh, research questions to pursue in these areas. And so the topics were communicable diseases, injuries and violence, mental health, non-communicable diseases, nutrition, physical activity, substance use, and health policy. The uh, methodology for this, um, for setting research priorities, um, is, uh, has been uh, established um, by organizations like the World Health Organization. Um, and one sort of note is that this particular exercise focused on those eight areas that I described, um, and a, def a different exercise was focused on sexual and reproductive health. Um, so that's why we did not cover those topics, but that's obviously a very important area of adolescent health. Um, so the method that was used was based on the Child Health and Nutrition Research Initiative method. It's actually the most common research priority setting method um, that has been used since 2000. And basically it has three different phases. Um, the first is to identify world experts on these areas of interest. Um, the second is to uh, invite those experts to um, actually provide their input as to what they think are the research priorities um, for the next few years. So in this case, it was through 2030. Um, and and they, were, they could propose um, priority questions um, in four different areas. So it was descriptive research, discovery, delivery, or development. Um, and then the final step of this process was actually to have these experts um, peer review each other's questions. So they basically um, all were able to submit several questions and then the final list was compiled and they basically ranked each other's questions um, such that there was a prioritized list of you know, the top 10 research priorities in each of these areas. And so uh, we conducted this just via an online survey of these experts. Um, in, in SurveyMonkey. Um, and so uh, the, the resulting publication um, has basically the top 10 questions in each area. And I'll go through the highlights of, and themes of, of the research priorities in each of these areas. Um, but if you are interested in looking at more details, the uh, full list of questions um, can be looked, 
uh, linked at that Journal of Adolescent Health article. And so I've asked Sohil to post that if you're interested, it's open access. Um, so we can just get started. So the first area was communicable diseases prevention and ma management. And so the top question there was, uh, what are key barriers faced by adolescents to access tuberculosis and tuberculosis HIV diagnostic and treatment services in high and low income countries and how can these be overcome? Now, one thing that I also uh, wanted to mention is that a lot of these questions actually were tuberculosis dominated particularly because the, um, the area of HIV was covered previously in that sexual and reproductive health um, uh, research priority uh, process. And then there was also a separate HIV uh, research priorities process, which I'll talk about later. So this, um, this one actually focused mostly on TB. Um, and again, these are all people who are focused on adolescent health. Um, so you can see some of the other uh, priorities in this area. And a lot of them were 40% uh, were on epidemiology or descriptive questions. Um, so interestingly, in terms of injuries and violence, the top question was actually about barriers and facilitators of motorcycle helmet legislation. Um, but other topics included drowning and bullying, um, gender-based violence and rape. Um, and then several questions um, were related to applying or combining interventions in one or more areas. So for instance, com combining uh, alcohol intervention with a brief violence reduction intervention. Uh, in terms of mental health, uh, the top prioritized question was what would be the most cost-effective, affordable, and feasible package of interventions for promotion of mental health um, and prevention of mental health disorders in adolescents? Um, and also about integration of management of mental health into primary care, into reproductive health services, and also into adolescent health friendly services. Um, in terms of non-communicable diseases, um, actually the top question was related to uh, rapid test for strep pharyngitis, as this is the leading cause of rheumatic heart disease. Um, and so it was really more of a discovery question. And some of the questions were related to applying existing interventions um, from one population to another. For instance, some of the NCD management strategies that have been used in adults, trying to make them focus on adolescents. Um, and similarly, some of the strategies that have been used in high income settings um, to translate them to low income settings. Uh, in terms of nutrition, uh, actually, the top priority question was about anemia and what are the causes of anemia among adolescent girls and how does this vary by region? Um, and so four of the top five questions were actually epidemiology or description questions. Uh, and some were related to actually sort of the dual burden of both overnutrition and undernutrition. Um, and then others were about risk factors and nutrition and pregnancy. In terms of physical activity, uh, the top question was about predicting um, from various levels, systems, and contexts um, different patterns of physical activity in adolescents in low and middle income countries. Um, and half of them were related to school based um, interventions for physical activity. Um, for substance use, the top question was what prevention and treatment strategies um, related to substance use are acceptable to adolescents. Um, three were about alcohol, two were about tobacco, um, and then three of them were also about community-based or peer-based interventions. Um, finally, there was an area on just health policy and social systems. And so the top question was what are platforms and strategies that are most effective to reach the most vulnerable adolescents, particularly those who are not in school or those in slums or are living in poverty. Um, three were related to primary care um, and three were related to technology or innovation like mobile health um, or social media. So that was sort of a summary of those uh, quantitative research priorities. But as I had mentioned, um, a prior exercise had looked at sexual and reproductive health, um, and uh, the next priorities was focused on adolescent HIV. 
Um, and so I also did a mixed method study that actually took the top questions from those other exercises and sort of synthesized them um, in kind of interesting visual ways. And so basically, if I just enter all the top 10 questions from each of the uh, priorities into a word cloud, these are sort of the themes that were highlighted. So uh, effects, intervention, schools um, seem to be the most common sort of themes or words that came up in these research priorities. Um, we also analyzed all the questions to look at um, what were considered, what populations were considered the most vulnerable. vulnerable. Um, and so those included um, adolescents living with HIV or tuberculosis or mental illness, um, as well as those um, who are victims of gender-based violence or, um, or out of school. Um, finally, in terms of uh, you know, trying to get these priorities to align with UN strategies, as I had mentioned, the UN um, global strategy had recently included adolescents. It was updated from the global strategy for women and children to be the global strategy for women, children, and adolescents. Um, and within that strategy, they actually had a paradigm called survive, thrive, and transform. So the first sort of area was about survival, like mortality, getting people to, um, to not die. Uh, but beyond basic survival, um, you know, you don't just want people to survive with poor quality of life. So there was also an emphasis on thriving as a, as a priority, and then also because of that, then being able to transform or like, you know, since adolescence is a developmental period, you basically are transforming into an adult. And so we also tried to frame some of these questions um, based on this paradigm of survive, thrive, and transform. So that was, you know, the, the sort of research talk about um, the adolescent research priorities that I worked on at at WHO, but I wanted to take this opportunity to give you a little bit of the backstory and some of the lessons that I have learned. Um, so the first uh, was that I mentioned I did this as a World Health Organization um, summer internship while I was a pediatrics resident. Um, and I had initially uh, gone into medicine because I actually really wanted to work on global health issues. And in college, I took a introduction to global health class where sort of our final project was to do a Sort of mock WHO summit um, where we, you know, pretended that we were presenting to the World Health Organization and we had to do some research on a, on a policy issue. And for whatever reason, after that uh, exercise, it had always been on my bucket list to try to work in some capacity at the World Health Organization. And so uh, when I was, uh, I had basically chosen to do the global health track in medical school and in residency. Um, and as part of that, we had to, you know, do a academic or scholarly project. And I really wanted to work on adolescent health at the World Health Organization. Um, and so I basically, but it's actually kind of hard to figure out who works at the World Health, health Organization. Um, and like, you know, the directory of people is not publicly available. So, um, so I think that my lesson from this is uh, to persevere. And so if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And it's just to say that I basically went through every single report that was related to adolescent health that had been published from WHO, and I looked up, you know, the people who were listed on those reports. Um, and since there was no directory, I didn't actually have their contact info, but, you know, the general, I, I learned that the general trend is like last name, first initial at WHO.int. So I basically emailed like at least 20 people um, to see if, you know, they would be interested in taking an intern. Um, and I basically got no responses. I then um, tried to, I had some friends or other students who had uh, interned at WHO and so I tried to use them with their contacts. Um, and again, I had no uh, responses. Um, and it wasn't until I actually interviewed for fellowship, uh, adolescent medicine fellowship here at UCSF. I mean, I was interviewing with our division chief, Charles Irwin, uh, who at the time was the editor of the Journal of Adolescent Health. And I was talking to him about how I was really trying so hard to you know, get involved with some research at the World Health Organization. Um, and he said, oh, you know what, maybe I, one of the associate editors at the Journal of Adolescent Health you know, works there, so maybe I can contact 
them. And so basically, he, after, you know, I don't know, 40 emails or so, finally, the email that he sent um, went through. And so that person then responded to me. And that's sort of how I got involved in this project. Um, so I think the first lesson that I sort of learned is just to keep on persevering. Um, now, the, the second lesson that I learned is this comes from my current um, research mentor, um, Kirsten Bibbins Domingo. She always encouraged me to focus on big, important questions that will change a field or clinical management. Um, and then, you know, once you sort of establish your expertise or make sort of this big contribution, then people will come to you for expertise. Um, I think that as a, you know, a academic and researcher, um, many people are, you know, focused on trying to get papers out. Um, and she sort and I think that I was sort of in this mentality as well, where, you know, I was trying to work on smaller projects, um, just to sort of get a paper out. And she mentioned her advice was like, you know, don't do research just to get a statistical significance um, and, and publish it, but really to try to think about what, what are really important questions that either have research gaps or, or will change management and really pursue those big questions um, and don't waste your time on, on the small ones. Um, and so that also um, was helpful for me because um, you know, this research priority exercise at WHO seemed like a really big, important question um, just because the field of adolescent health is, was so um, young. Um, and so in terms of choosing projects, that sort of also helped guide me towards this WHO-related project. Um, and, and she was right. So basically after I um, sort of, you know, got the opportunity to lead this um, research prioritization exercise, um, which to me was like a, felt like a big important question, um, people will then come free to you for expertise. So, um, you know, once the, the project was done, I was invited to go back to Geneva to, you know, present at a technical consultation where they sort of discussed this with a bunch of experts. Um, and then actually the methodology that I learned, this um, Chinri research prioritization methodology, even though it's the most commonly used uh, method, I have to say that um, it really takes sort of a large organization like WHO to um, put it together. And so not that many people are familiar with the actual method. Um, and so uh, because I had spent the whole summer learning about it and implementing it, um, I then sort of was, became like an expert in this Shinri method and was then able to participate or was invited to, you know, do the analysis for um, an implementation science um, prioritization in like South Africa um, the next year. And then, as I had mentioned, um, WHO then did research priorities for pediatric and adolescent HIV, um, and they needed somebody to do the analysis. So then um, I got hired to do that analysis. Um, and so I think, you know, trying to focus on a big question and develop skills in a certain method um, was definitely good advice for me. Um, and so, so, yeah, then subsequently I was able to work on the HIV. Um, priorities both for adolescent health and for um, child health, like pediatrics. Um, and, and that also then led me to a little bit more work on HIV, which, um, and ad adolescent HIV, which I will talk about next. Um, so at this point, I thought I'd just take a brief pause to see if there are any questions for a clarification. I also will um, have more time at the end to take questions, but just, um, Wanted to see if anybody had any questions at this point. People can feel free to unmute themselves and ask the question directly or type it in the chat and I'm happy to read it out loud. And maybe while folks are thinking, I have a question, Jason. So, well, first, thanks for not only sharing the content, but also your process and the personal journey and the lessons learned. Um, I'm curious, this work was done, I think the dates were around 2016. Uh, in terms of priority setting and an agenda, it's now been four years. Has has those questions been uh, been in fact the priority, and have they been addressed to some extent? Are you noticing a prom promise? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I think that uh, it'll be sort of an interesting uh, metric to actually see how 
the current agenda, you know, aligns with what we identified as priorities back then. I will say that just in terms of like the non-communicable or for the communicable diseases section, um, it does seem like there has been a uh, quite a bit of movement in adolescent tuberculosis, which I think is, um, you know, which I think may have foreshad been foreshadowed by this. Um, yeah, I think one interesting, and I, and I think maybe each of those eight areas has like a slightly different story, but uh, one thing that I, I thought was very fascinating about the tuberculosis story was that there was like a really active working group on adolescent tuberculosis. Um, and as you can see, that really ended up dominating that research priorities area. And so it is potentially a limitation of the method that, you know, because experts are peer reviewing each other's stuff, if there are a lot of adolescent TB experts, then that sort of, you know, they'll, I, I guess it's like a insular thing where they'll promote that. But it's just to say that it was very hard actually to see, for instance, adolescent malaria experts or people who focus on adolescent like neglected tropical diseases. And I think that that is reflected in the research agenda where there has been quite a bit of focus on adolescent tuberculosis and uh, not as much on some of the other uh, neglected top tropical diseases potentially because there um, you know, aren't focused researchers in that field that we were aware of. All right, well, I will continue on and then um, have time for questions at the end as well. So uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, research on food insecurity in Kenya. Um, and in particular, I worked on uh, Mfungano Island, which is uh, in Suba district in Kenya. So it's right on the shore of Lake Victoria over here. Um, Suba district uh, has a very high prevalence of HIV. So um, as you can see, it's over 15%. Um, and so this is the area that I was focused on. Uh, now food insecurity, which is defined as limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate safe foods um, was basically nearly universal among people living with HIV in this district. So. Uh, as sort of my first global health research project, I did actually um, mixed method, qualitative and quantitative interviews where we administered the household food insecurity access score, which is a measure of food insecurity, but then also people sort of to talk about their lived experience of food insecurity. And based on that objective measure, we found that 80% of people living with HIV in this district um, experienced or, or would be classified as severely food insecure. Um, and really had some very powerful um, narratives about the experience of being hungry with HIV. And so I just included one quote here, a person who is on antiretrovirals who said, when you take these drugs, you feel so hungry. If you take them on an empty stomach, they just burn. Um, we also collected anthropometric data um, and found that 30% of the adults living with HIV in this region uh, would be considered undernourished, so with a BMI of less than 18. Um, so for those of you who are in the UCSF Global Health Pathway, um, my, I guess, official pathway project as a medical student was actually evaluating um, people who are getting a food by prescription nutrition supplement. Um, uh, for, and this was people who are living with HIV were eligible for this in, in the Anza province. Um, so it was just a secondary data analysis, but basically the goal was to evaluate the effect of the food by prescription macronutrient intervention um, on adults living with HIV. Um, and so the intervention was a corn, soy, flour, uh, which was served as porridge, um, but it included, you know, some macronutrients in it and it was provided by USAID. Um, and so we sort of looked at the outcomes of people who were receiving this supplementation and found that on average, um, people gained about 1.8 kilograms um, or 0.65 kilograms meter per meter squared in BMI. The greatest gains were among those who were the most severely malnourished. Um, and, and while there were overall gains, um, you know, the people were still relatively malnourished. So um, only, uh, so as you can see, 
um, only 20% of clients actually attained a BMI of greater than 20. So even though there were gains for those who were um, under 18.5, you know, they were moderate or mild. Um, and the highest uh, rate of attainment was among people who were already who already started off at a higher BMI. Um, so this was, uh, you know, a secondary data analysis evaluation of, of a program that was already in existence. But uh, I think that one sort of analogy that I will sort of use is, you know, there's an adage that goes, if, if you give a man a fish, um, you feed him for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, you can feed him for a lifetime. And so while, you know, nutrition supplementation for people who are hungry and food insecure is certainly very important, um, it's not necessarily sustainable. Um, and so uh, the overall team that I've been working with uh, was sort of developing next steps on a more sustainable intervention. And so they came up with uh, some pilot data and pilot studies to actually test a multi-sectoral agricultural intervention for people with HIV. So this actually included a microfinance loan. Um, and as part of that loan, um, farmers in the area, because this was mostly a rural um, subsistence farming um, area, could get human ha uh, powered water pumps because um, Lake Victoria was right there and you can pump water from Lake Victoria to irrigate your farms even during like the drought season. Um, and then seeds, fertilizers and pesticides, as well as education in sustainable agriculture and in financial management. So it was sort of a multi-sector um, intervention that, um, you know, ideally would be more sustainable than just giving people food, you know, on a daily basis. Um, so as I mentioned, there was a pilot study that um, showed improvements in food insecurity, diet quality, and even HIV health outcomes um, in adults with HIV, and also um, improved nutritional outcomes in, in the younger children. And so in 2016, they launched a larger um, cluster randomized control trial um, of 704 adults and then 352 children, um, but these were younger children, so six months to three years old, who were uh, living in these households. Um, and and at, at this point, the main study was really focused on, as I mentioned, young children and adults, um, but there was an opportunity since you know there were certainly teenagers who were living in these households and um, everyone in the household could theoretically be influenced by this intervention especially because it you know was more sustainable and uh, at a household level so we actually got some side funding to actually study the teenagers who lived in these households um, and see if the intervention actually affected um, outcomes in terms of sexual and reproductive health um, and also in nutritional health. Um, and so there were some uh, other funding sources that we were able to utilize to, uh, to start collecting data on the, on the teenagers who lived in this household, these households. Um, and so the overall hypothesis is just that this, um, by having a multi-component intervention with um, you know, all these parts would Im improve both food insecurity and wealth and these are sort of like social determinants of, of adolescent health outcomes so that you know, mental health, education, empowerment, and self-esteem, and ultimately you know, uh, risk for sexually transmitted infections and uh, behaviors, and as well as nutrition would, could be affected. So the um, study is actually now completed um, and we're in the process of um, uh, analyzing the data. So I don't have the preliminary results yet, but, um, but this is sort of just a uh, conceptual framework of, of our hypotheses. Um, now, I also wanted to take a step back and talk a little bit about uh, career development um, and lessons learned um, from my experiences in Kenya, um, which actually started before I started medical school. So I, I think my first, um, research experience in, in Kenya doing those household food insecurity surveys was actually back in 2008, which was the year before I started medical school. And so uh, to, to talk about the background on that, I think I mentioned that in undergrad, I took this uh, global health class. Um, and 
in that class, we read uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains, which is this you know, New York Times bestseller about Paul Farmer, um, who is a physician um, at Harvard uh, and an anthropologist. And I basically, because of this book and his inspiration, that sort of was what uh, made me decide to pursue medicine and global health. And I basically uh, chose him as my role model and tried to like emulate him in every way possible. And so basically from, which is highlighted in his, this book and in biography, um, you know, Paul Farmer basically had this great love for patients and patient care. And so the title Mountains Beyond Mountains is because he um, basically would go like hike through mountains to like reach, you know, the most distant um, patients. Um, and his work primarily was in, in Haiti. Um, and he sort of treated like that, like his second home. He was always traveling there at any like moment, even during his you know, medical training. And while he was a physician, he also got training in medical anthropology. Um, and so he had sort of this academic and methodologic focus as well. Um, and he really also used this work to advocate for, um, for you know, social justice. And so he had these you know, catchy um, titles like infections and inequalities or pathologies of power. Um, and his role model was Rudolf, Rudolf Dierkchow, who um, was one of the, you know, founders of modern public health. And so I was uh, very much uh, trying to, you know, follow in his footsteps. And so basically, actually, in, in college, we invited him to give a talk and we had like a roundtable discussion and uh, it was very inspiring. And as I mentioned, I basically just tried to copy <laughs> everything that he had done in his career. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I was applying to medical school. Um, I started doing this research um, in Mfungano Island in Kenya. Um, and I actually decided to defer medical school for a year to pursue a master's degree in medical anthropology. And that's when I had done this, uh, this initial study was through that master's. Um, and so the dissertation of that master's was called Hunger and HIV. So I even tried to use his alliteration technique. Um, and he was, you know, my, my role model. Um, and this was all fine and good. Uh, but when I started medical school and, you know, the sort of long process to medical training with um, medical school and then residency and fellowship, um, there were some other, you know, considerations that I just had to Take into account. So the first, um, which was uh, is documented in in the book, um, was that actually Paul's medical school classmates nicknamed him Paul Foreigner because uh, he basically was never at medical school. He like even though he was at Harvard, he spent all of his free time during medical school in Haiti doing work like that, and he you know was only at school when he needed to be for tests and stuff. But that's you know okay if you're a genius like Paul Farmer, but for most of us, you actually need to focus on medical school in order to pass. Um, and so I learned relatively quickly that, you know, medical school and residency is really a full-time job. And so it, it was not going to be feasible for me to, you know, sort of do that as a second, as a, as a second job, but really I had to focus on medical school in order to just pass and, and get through the clinical training. Um, and then there were also just, uh, you know, personal and family considerations when you're um, engaged in global health, such that, you know, if, uh, that, you know, if you are going to be traveling a lot, um, you can better have a supportive family or a partner um, who also uh, feels those same ways. Otherwise, it, you know, is, is a little bit harder or can cause tensions. Um, and in particular for me, when I first was at Kenya, again, before I had started medical school, um, I was single and I was not out, but um, during medical school, I actually, um, you know, came out as, uh, as gay and I started dating. Um, and actually one really challenging logistical thing for me was that uh, in Kenya at the time, uh, when I was first there, actually, I was there during the constitutional election um, when they basically reaffirmed, you know, that homosexuality is illegal and would be basically 14 years imprisonment if anyone was caught. Um, and so that actually also, you know, led to uh, a lot of uh, challenges for me in deciding whether or not I could really meaningfully engage um, 
there because I, I you know, I had a boyfriend who I eventually married, um, and it it felt a little bit risky to go to a place where you know, if anyone found out, you know, I could be put in jail, um, and and so that was also a, a consideration in in terms of continuing work, um, you know, in that context, um, and so. I had a lot of uh, reflection and uh, and soul searching, um, and I, I sort of shift paradigms a little bit from the Paul Farmer model. So I don't know if any of you recognize um, this other person who's next to Paul. I think this was you know when they were early in their training or, or medical students. But the the man to Paul's right is uh, Jim Kim, and so he is also sort of featured in this book, he's sort of the co-founder with Paul uh, Farmer of Partners in Health. Um, but he, you know, some sort of <laughs> aspect of him is that he had very practical Asian immigrant parents. Um, I think he grew up in Iowa and his parents had immigrated from Korea. Um, he, similarly to Paul, followed this medical anthropology background. Um, but he sort of is portrayed in the book as, as a little bit of Paul's sidekick. Like, you know, Paul Farmer is going back and forth to Haiti all the time and doing, uh, you know, really amazing work, um, but is basically traveling all the time and stuff. And Jim is sort of the guy who's behind the scenes, um, you know, trying to work out some of the deals. And, uh, and he sort of followed a, a path where he, you know, he also raised, you know, got to prominence. So he ended up actually becoming the director of HIV AIDS at the World Health Organization. Um, he then became Dartmouth's um, president, um, and then most recently was the president of the World Bank. Um, but his approach, I think, was a little bit more like diplomatic and through uh, you know, some of the larger organizations um, to affect change in global health. And so, uh, and so my sort of <laughs> role model then went from being Paul Farmer to, to Jim Kim. And so I similarly uh, would try to track him down <laughs> wherever he, he went. So this was when he was actually the president of Dartmouth. They had a fundraiser um, here in San Francisco. And I have no affiliation with Dartmouth whatsoever. But everybody knew that I was so obsessed with him that my med school classmates who had gone there <laughs> invited me to the event. And, and I think I actually went to two or three of them. And <laughs> And he was like, why are you here? You're not affiliated with this university. But uh, anyway, I was still uh, an honor to go you know, talk with him. And so I think that some of the lessons that I learned in given some of these personal considerations um, and just you know, the, the requirements of medical um, and clinical training um, were first, uh, rather than being like the person who has to you know, build a program from scratch um, with like Paul Farmer did and, you know, have all of the responsibilities that come with it, um, it may be a little bit more sustainable to join a larger, well-established program that has, you know, long-term institutional affiliations and mentorship. And so, um, so the, the Kenya program that I had been involved with first, you know, the, the first interviews that I I did was a little bit on my own, but it turns out that the, um, the medical clinics that actually serve that region uh, are part of the Family AIDS Care and Education Services program. That's an affiliation with, um, with um, UCSF and the CDC and some other organizations. Um, but that provided um, sort of long-term mentorship and infrastructure. And so, for instance, Craig Cohen and Sherry Weiser here um, were then my, my research mentors when I started medical school here at UCSF, um, and they've now been my mentors for over a decade. Um, and as was sort of evidenced by the research talk, you know, most of their research is fo focused on adults with HIV, um, but there was an interest in trying to start to focus on adolescents. And so while they had this large randomized control child going on, it was a good opportunity for me to say, oh, you know, look, there are teenagers who live in these households. Maybe we can do a, a side project or an ancillary study that, you know, looks at the impact on health of the teenagers who live in these households. And so it was uh, a little bit more feasible for me to be a part of because, 
you know, the, the larger randomized control trial was already going on. It was just a matter of collecting um, data on a few more, um, you know, household members, but I didn't actually have to des design the intervention or, um, you know, get the funding for, for all that. So it was a little bit more feasible and sustainable. Um, and, you know, I think another important thing is because there was already a study infrastructure, it was um, much easier to get the adolescent study running because um, basically they already had a full research staff in Kenya that was hired for the, um, for the adult uh, and pediatric studies. So it was mainly a matter of, you know, working with the staff <coughs> and training them on the adolescent specific questions and being able to, you know, take a sexual history. Um, but basically they already had a full staff. They had already been trained in, in research um, methods and interviewing. Um, so it was, a, it was a, I guess, a lower bar to, than, than starting fully from scratch. Um, another lesson that I learned is that local health is global health. Um, and so we sometimes refer to this as global health. Um, and so while I had you know, done a lot of research on food insecurity in Kenya, I actually started working with you know, one of my mentors, Sherry Weiser, on food insecurity in the USA um, and looking at uh, some of the pre-existing data and cohort studies in adolescents and young adults to start to document health consequences of food insecurity in the USA. And so we've now done a number of studies looking at food insecurity and mental health, chronic diseases, sexual risk, substance use, and sleep disturbances uh, in the US. And I think food insecurity is a really important social determinant of health you know, regardless of the region. And so I think, uh, yeah, local, global, local health is global health. And I feel like doing this research, um, you know, is still important, whether it's locally or, or globally. Um, another lesson that I, I learned is, you know, I would, since the start of my career, I've always been interested in nutritional issues and malnutrition. And so, um, you know, my first research was actually in, in Guatemala on malnutrition. And then, you know, my main focus at, as I was doing my medical anthropology uh, master's in medical school was the work that I had just described on food insecurity in Kenya. Um, but as I got further along in my medical training, and I, as I mentioned, it was a little bit harder to go back and forth um, to Kenya, I kept my focus on malnutrition, but um, but I actually started to focus on malnutrition from eating disorders, which was a you know, big problem in the Bay Area and particularly in, in adolescence. And so uh, it allowed me sort of to refine my focus as I went in my career to still focus on malnutrition, but you know, potentially in a different context and with the adolescent focus. Um, and another bit of advice that I got was because I was interested in, in malnutrition was to actually try to align your clinical work with your research whenever possible. Um, and so actually I feel very lucky that in my position right now, I, my clinical role is mainly um, in inpatient eating disorders. And so I manage the pathophysiology of severe malnutrition and refeeding syndrome. And actually that physiology is very um, parallel, whether it's from eating disorders or severe malnutrition from food insecurity, um, you know, the same, process of starvation happens. And so the, the medical management actually in some ways is very similar. Um, and so my research actually has recently has focused more on eating disorders in male populations and, and muscle dysmorphia. Um, and I, I think that as I did that shift, um, it felt to me like I was going away from global health because, um, you know, this is maybe was at least to me perceived to be sort of a niche area that you know mostly affected high income countries and you know maybe was specific to the US and or the Bay Area. Um, but I actually got advice from one advisor that you don't actually have to, you don't have to do a topic that is traditionally um, in global health. You know, I think that a lot of people who do go into global health, like go into infectious diseases or HIV or tuberculosis, those are you know, the very common um, areas for global health. But actually this mentor said, 
you know, people around the world are affected by all different types of problems. And you don't have to just do you know, an infectious disease thing to do global health. You can do eating disorders. You can do whatever specialty or clinical interests you have. And actually, he was right. Uh, it turns out that you know, body image and eating disorder issues actually affects people all over the world. Um, and so it was just as I have developed more expertise in male eating disorders and muscle dysmorphia, um, it's also allowed me to collaborate with people all over the world on, on research on this topic. And so this is just an example of um, a validation of a measure to actually measure muscle dysmorphia in men in Argentina. This is um, a study that I worked on with um, Emilio Comte, who was a Fulbright scholar here at UCSF from Argentina, who validated the eating disorder um, gold standard questionnaire in, in Spanish for male samples in Argentina. Um, and then we also, uh, in the last year, have worked on developing uh, a different scale for muscularity-oriented disordered eating, um, which was initially made into English. Um, but since it's been published and we made the, the scale um, open access and fully available, um, we've actually had the opportunity to collaborate with people from all over the world and translate it into different um, languages. And so even something that I had initially thought to be very niche and not applicable to global health, like male eating disorders or muscle dysmorphia, actually um, is relevant um, around the world. So I thought that that was uh, a good lesson for me as well. Um, so just to summarize some of these lessons learned, uh, you know, jo joining a larger study group that already has an established infrastructure and then taking on a specific research question uh, is a way to, to help make a project, especially for a trainee or early professional, a little bit more feasible. Um, you know, local health is global health, so um, doing work locally, I think, still counts uh, for sure. Um, Trying to align your clinical work with your research um, can help uh, just to have you be sane. Um, and then finally, you can pursue any specialty or any area of focus and apply it globally. Um, and this is you know, particularly the case in adolescent health, which has such a paucity of, of research globally and even in eating disorders in, in male populations, which um, I initially thought there would be no way that I would be able to do global health work in. Um, so just in the interest of time, I think that I'm going to move on to the last section on International App Association for Adolescent Health Young Professionals Network, and then I'll um, do questions at the end. Um, but as I sort of have mentioned, uh, there really is a paucity of adolescent health training programs around the world. Um, you know, in the U.S., there are some fellowship programs, uh, like we have here at UCSF and in Australia, there are some too. But overall, um, the field of adolescent health is generally quite new, um, and there aren't really specific uh, accredited programs in, in most regions of the world to get training in adolescent health and medicine. Um, and similarly, there are very few national organizations or professional societies in adolescent health you know, at, at the national level um, in most countries. And so to address this gap, um, the International Association for Adolescent Health, whose president for the last several years um, is Susan Sawyer, um, decided to launch a young professionals network. Um, and so this was really aimed at helping to train the next generation or provide training and education resources for people around the world who may not have uh, you know, access to a specific training program in their country and to provide a professional network. Um, and so the IAAH in general um, has been around for a long time and the main priorities have been to you know, enhance competencies and national capacity and global investment in adolescent health. Um, and then specifically the Young Professionals Network um, has been focused on, the, on students, trainees, and early career professionals. Um, and, and informing this global network. Um, so I actually was very lucky in that um, three years ago in 2017, uh, every four years there's an Adolescent Health World Congress. 
um, and that was in Delhi. Um, and at that meeting, it was uh, decided or uh, by the council and the IWH president, Susan Sawyer, to try to launch a Young Professionals Network. Um, and I was invited to be one of the people who started thinking about how this network would look like. Um, and so over the last two to three years, it's been really a great um, privilege and honor to start to build a, a Young Professionals Network in adolescent health um, internationally. And so in that time, we've developed the mission statement, which uh, you can see here. Um, we've also done a number of surveys with, um, with people interested in adolescent health um, around the world um, and have, based on that feedback, formed four committees. Um, the first is communications, uh, then community engagement, leadership and mentorship, um, and education and training. And each of these committees has officers now that lead them um, and they overall um, the goals of each of these committees are, are listed here but some of the sort of exciting things that we are really pleased to, to launch are um, first you know this is actually the first of our month of monthly webinars that are going to be happening from the young professionals network so this was focused on global adolescent health career development the next one will be on October 5th um, and that will be on adolescence and COVID. Um, and then the November one will actually be with the uh, IWH president, um, Susan Sawyer. Um, we've also, uh, thanks to the great work of the education and training team, and I think I saw Melissa and some of the other people here, um, they've actually put together a, re a database um, that lists um, all the training and re education resources, including online um, adolescent health courses, um, key articles, uh, so even some of the articles that I listed here, like the Lancet Commission and the Research Priorities Exercise and the WHO resources um, are all sort of compiled into one database. Um, and then also an online network. Um, so we have a LinkedIn group that, um, where people can post questions or, um, or interesting like news updates. Um, and then there's also uh, you know, engagement in Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And then, uh, you know, in the next few months, we're also trying to launch a mentorship program. So, uh, you know, linking trainees and students and early career professionals to a more senior mentor, um, especially for those who, you know, may be in countries or regions where there's not, uh, you know, an established mentor in, the, in their country. Um, so this is our organizational structure that we've uh, developed over the last few years. And so, as I mentioned, we have the four committees and uh, each of the committees has, has officers who have been leading them. Um, and here are our current um, co-chairs and officers. Um, and as you can see from the prior slide, they come from all the different regions of the world. Um, and I think that the sort of final lesson that I learned through this um, you know, as a quotation actually from the Paul Farmer book, um, they, Paul and Jim always quoted Margaret Mead and they said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so I do think that working in teams, um, like with a Young Professionals Network, has been, uh, you know, a really great opportunity to um, further, you know, education training opportunities for people interested in adolescent health. Um, and, and it's uh, something that, you know, I've been very passionate about and is continuing to grow and thrive. So that's very exciting. Um, so just to summarize some of the lessons that I've learned um, along the way, um, you know, perseverance pays. So if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Um, try to focus on a big, important question that can change a field. Um, Join a larger study group um, with an established infrastructure and then take on a very specific, um, smaller, feasible portion of that. Um, local health is global health. Align your clinical work with your research um, in any topic or specialty. And uh, you know, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Um, global health is all about teamwork. Um, so I would just like to thank uh, some of my mentors here at UCSF, um, including people at the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine and the Institute for Global Health Sciences and 
um, Dr. Sowell sued for organizing this event. Um, also, the IWH Council and President, as well as the Young Professionals Network co-chairs and officers, who I think many of them are here um, in this webinar. Um, and then finally, my mentors at the World Health Organization, who, uh, who mentored me through the research priorities process. Um, so if you're interested in joining the Young Professionals Network um, and or engaging in any of the committees um, here, and I'm also gonna ask Sohil to post the links to the chat. Um, there, we have an intake questionnaire. Um, so if you just want to like join the listserv and provide a little bit of information in terms of your interest, um, the link is over there. Um, just for more information about the IWH, you can go to the website. Um, and then the, the current education and training resources um, database that we have is available at that link. And that has um, links to some of the articles that I mentioned in this talk, as well as uh, a list of conferences and training resources uh, in adolescent health by region. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take questions and thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you, Jason. Um, if we were in a live physical space, this is the point at which you would hear lots of applause and I see some reactions indicating so. Uh, people can again feel free to type questions in the chat or unmute themselves. Uh, there's a couple questions that have come up that you may have subsequently addressed, uh, but it pertained to, and maybe these questions can be addressed to both you and people already in the uh, Young Professionals Network uh, for IAAH, but um, a lot of the advice you gave was around uh, entering global health in general. Do you, do you have specific advice for young professionals beginning their journey in global adolescent health? Apart from number one, sounds like join the network. <laughs> you can start. Yeah, I think that um, in terms of global adolescent health, it, I think one of the exciting things about it is it is such a relatively new field that um, I think there are the opportunities, I think, are that in some of the pre-existing global health um, you know, programs and frameworks, you can really um, sort of bring in an adolescent focus. Um, I think that, yeah, my... I think the good thing about being a new field is that like it's open for, you know, for a lot of engagement and work and you can really make a big difference in this field. But I think one of the downsides is that there's not as uh, well established, uh, you know, training pathways and, and stuff like that. So it does seem like you have to do a little bit more uh, groundwork on your own. But I do think that that's part of what the Young Professionals Network is trying to do is to try to consolidate some of these resources. Um, so I think that, um, that yeah, I mean, joining that work and trying to share um, resources and, and advice amongst people who really focused in adolescent health is what I would recommend. Great, thanks. Uh, another question here. Thanks so much for a wonderful presentation. How has funding reshaped your research or the direction of your research? Do you have any advice for finding funding um, to do research in more niche areas? Yeah, thanks so much, Omar. That's a really important question and one that I, I think that I didn't exactly directly address head on, but um, what part of the, um, the, the discussion on local health being global health, I think, is the reality that at least for me, working in the US, um, you know, it is actually harder to get funding to do international work um, when a lot of, uh, you know, like the National Institutes of Health or certain organizations do prioritize um, funding, you know, for, you know, if US taxpayers are going to be paying for this, it, a lot of it does focus on, on US issues. And so, um, the reality is that, yeah, right now, most of my funding uh, is to do research on uh, adolescent health in the U.S. And that's great. And I think that, you know, there are certainly so many uh, areas of need uh, in terms of, of U.S. stuff. But I think that part of the reason why I've had that focus is, is because of funding availability. Um, now, I'm still very passionate about, you know, working in, in internationally. and so. Uh, 
So I, I do feel like to some extent, some of the global health work that I've been doing is sort of like, uh, um, you know, my day job or what pays my bills is to work on US-based research, um, but I still have you know, a strong interest in international stuff. And so I still am trying for, um, for smaller grants and stuff like that to continue the work in Kenya. Um, but it is a consideration that, you know, if you want to continue this work, you do um, have to fund it. And it is just a little bit more challenging sometimes to get funding to work in uh, another area. So it's a good question. And I think a real dilemma that many people working in global health face. All right, and I think with then, um, maybe unless there's any uh, lingering questions, we can go ahead and close. Uh, this session is being recorded, and so um, more information will come about about where it may be posted, um, uh, you know, pending, pending a few other logistical considerations too. And thank you again, Jason, uh, not only for just uh, uh, providing some content, but also uh, providing some candid reflections upon your personal journey.